All right, so this handout I made available uh, to you in the uh, class e-learning site. And so if you want to, you know, you know, print this one off or, or have it so that you can write your notes on, your notes on it, uh, you can go ahead and do this. You're not going to be able to write anything on this version, but these are going to serve as the, the lecture notes. Now, I know that in your past math, math education, you've seen statistical graphs before, if nothing else, and things that you read or in the newspaper, journals, and so on. So uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to work through a couple of examples and talk about some of the technical language that are involved in these graphs. So this is from section 2.1 and 2.2. And it's mostly graphs that deal with qualitative data at first. And then we're going to get into some graphs that deal with quantitative. So for the qualitative graphs, we have pie charts and bar graphs. Those are pretty much the two that I want you to be able to do. Now there are variations of pie charts and there are variations of bar graphs, but the base graph would be those two. And then the quantitative graphs that we're going to look at are histograms and stem and leaf plots. And one of the things that we're going to do uh, in this section also is create these things called um, uh, frequency distributions. Frequencies mean count. So we're actually going to count up individuals in our qualitative. How many of you responded Midland when I asked you the, uh, the, the county that you live in? Well, maybe it was five of you. And so we would just count and we would get five. Then if we knew the total number of students in the class, we could take five and divide by the number of students in the class and then convert that to a percentage. But the first thing we're gonna do when we have a, a raw data is we're gonna organize the data. In our first example, it looks like the data are already there summarized for you. So let's talk about the data. And then let's draw a pie chart related to this data. And then I'm going to take you over to Excel and I'm going to generate the graph in Excel just to show you how easy it is to do that. You know, you're not going to use Excel probably until your first project, but I'm going to show you anyway. Okay, so here, um, of all the plastic surgeries, this was done in the year 2009. So they, they looked at all of the plastic surgeries done in that year 2009 and this is what they these are estimates they're all rounded to the nearest thousand it looks like and the the most popular type of plastic surgery was breast augmentation followed by liposuction eyelid surgery nose reshaping and tummy tuck now when you add those numbers together um, you know there's there's probably other plastic surgeries that have been done and they say down in part A, if women had 1.35 million plastic surgeries, then when we add up all of those numbers there, all right, so when you add up all of these, you get 1 million and 12,000. That's the sum of all these. And, but we know that 1.35 million women in 2009 had some form of plastic surgery, cosmetic plastic surgery. So there's a difference between the sum of all these and then the, the total number as given in, in part A. So we're gonna subtract and we're gonna get 338,000. So there are 338,000 um, plastic surgeries unaccounted for. So I'm gonna create another category here, other, and write in the three, three, eight, zero, zero, zero. Then those six numbers would all add up to 100 or 1.35 million. All right, so you're gonna see something called a frequency distribution. And sometimes they're gonna throw in the word relative. frequency distribution. So with this example, I'd like to show you what is meant by frequency distribution. 
Now you can think of a distribution as just a, a summarized table. So distribution, how are the data distributed? This is part of statistics that we call organizing data. So we're organizing it in a table so that we can then present it. And most of the table is already done for us. But I do want to add one additional thing here, and that's the relative frequency column. So <clears throat> breast augmentation, liposuction, eyelid surgery, nose reshaping, tummy tuck, and other. And we have frequency. So while they don't label it on this graph, uh, you're going to be asked to draw frequency um, histograms, bar graphs, and so on. I'm just going to bring over the numbers from the, from the table and then show you how to calculate the relative frequency. And then we'll use that to draw our pie chart. And you do need the total, 1.35 million, in order to calculate the relative frequency. So, the relative frequency and frequency um, are two, are what we use on the vertical axis when we're doing bar graphs or when we're doing histograms. And only one set of numbers can go on the vertical axis. So you're either going to have relative frequency on the vertical axis or frequency. And they will specify in the problem which one they want. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to convert each one of these counts. And that's what a frequency is. It's a count. How many individuals? And what we would say is that 312,000 women got breast augmentation in 2009. That's what this means. We actually counted the number of individuals that had this, this cosmetic surgery. And these are the counts. Now the relative frequency, we're interested in what percentage of the whole. And so what we do is we take the count, the frequency, and divide by the total. And I'll do it on my calculator here, and just to show you how you get these. My calculator shows 0.23111, something like that. And it goes on forever. Now if you wanted to calculate then the percent um, to convert a decimal rate to a percent. You move the decimal point over two places and then I'm just rounding. You put the percent sign. So of all the surgeries that were done, we would say 23% of them were breast augmentations. And that's very close to 25%, which is about one fourth. So when you're drawing your pie chart, you want one, uh, one of the slices to be almost 23%. I'm going to quickly do these other ones and enter them in here. All right, this one was 284 divided by 135, so on. And that's 0.21. I'm going to round these to uh, three decimal places. And if you round to three decimal place, places on the rate, then the percent will, will be rounded to one decimal place. <clears throat> Do the same thing going all the way down. This is 0.111, so 11.1%. So I told you I was going to use uh, Excel, so I'm going to go there right now. Here you see these numbers from the table. And uh, really to draw a graph, all you need are those numbers. And I think we calculated this one to be 338. So there it is, 338. Now for the relative frequency, I'm going to take this number and then divide by the 1.35 million. And there you see the 23% number. What's nice about um, Excel is you can go ahead and use formulas. And so if you looked at our numbers, right here was the 23%. Here's the 21% and 11%, and here are the rest of them. And all of these percentages should add up to one. You can even change it to a percent and get more places of accuracy. So those are the percentages. 
25%. Now, if I wanted to create the bar graph, all I have to do is to highlight the data that I want to graph and then come up here and insert a graph that looks like a pie chart. And poof, there it is. Now, the only thing that you have to do to the graph from here is just add some bells and, whist bells and whistles. So there's the big one. So for example, if you click on the chart type and highlight everything, delete everything's there, then you can go and give the, the title right from cosmetic plastic surgeries. This is the title. Oops. You can make it larger if you like. You can click on the slices and add data labels. Maybe change their color. A lot of uh, bells and whistles on, on here that you can use. You can even um, highlight these and format them. And we will go through this in a lot more details. Um, so format the data labels. And we want to add the category name. And so you see on each slice, if we enlarge it, you see it a little better. You can change this to new line so that the numbers come on a new line. Uh, this one here looks like I can't see it because of the background. So I might go and select that one individually and change that color to black. And notice it puts a little leader line on here. Show leader lines. No? Yes. So there it is. Uh, Excel does a very nice job of of um, drawing these graphs, specifically if you have pie charts. Notice that the other category was about 25%, and that is exactly equal to one fourth of the whole circle. And lipos um, breast augmentation and liposuction, those two were very close to 25%. So there's a graph. And if you have the, the labels on each one of the slices, you don't need the legend down here. So I'm just gonna get rid of the legend. And there's a nice graph that um, can move things around. You want to take it off, you can take it off. Have a leader line. And play around. You can also put percentages on there as well. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. And we're going to continue through this worksheet. All right, so you can draw You know, something like this. It's hard to do uh, freehand, and that's why we use technology to do this so often. All right, so in terms of the questions, um, let me try to zoom this, uh, make this a little bigger. If women had 1.35 co um, million cosmetic surgeries in 2009, what percent was for tummy tucks? And so we had tummy tucks here, and I don't remember what that was. So I'm going to go take a look. And tummy tuck was 9.5. And I'll write the rest of them in here as well so you have them. What percent tummy tucks? 9.5%. And then it says what percent were for nose reshaping? Nose, 10.2. And how many surgeries are not accounted for in the graph? Well, we actually added onto the graph, but we know that there were 338,000 not accounted for and we actually included them in our graph. All right, so for this next example, um, this one is similar. 
But for this one, we're going to draw a bar graph. And notice it's, there's two different kinds of bar graphs here. And the only way that they differ is, is on what the uh, vertical axis is. So one of them is going to use the frequency column, and the other one is going to use the relative frequency column. Now, in order to calculate the relative frequency, um, we need to know the total. So we need to add up all these numbers. 7, 16, 21, 2, 5, 2, 5, 21. Okay, go ahead and complete this column. And let me just see if you're understanding things. Um, go ahead and tell me what number goes here. Go ahead and put it into the chat. And make sure that you're, you're keeping up and you're um, understanding what we're going. Because a lot of these problems, you'll be start with a problem like this where they'll give you the frequency, but then they'll later on, they'll ask you for the relative frequency bar graph. And so you need to know how to calculate the relative frequency from a table. So go ahead, put your answer in there. The question is, what decimal number goes here? Okay, very good. Um, looks like you're all on, on doing well on that. And you convert it to a decimal. And let's just have an agreement in here that we're going to round these decimals to uh, three decimal places. So 0.198 is, and remember that's uh, the equivalent of 19.8%. All right, complete the rest of the numbers in the table. 204 divided by 521 and so on. And this is what I get. Point. Three nine two point two five oh point one five two and point zero one zero. Now, because we did some rounding here, uh, if you add these numbers together, you may not get one right on the nose because of rounding error. And three nine two two five oh. Looks like everything was rounded up because everything's rounded up, then, then you get some strange. Um, so this actually turns out to be this, which is rounding error. Should be one. Okay, now when you add this column right here to this table, you have completed question A, where it says construct a relative frequency distribution. Distribution, another name for that, is table. We have most of the table here. We just had to add, we just had to add the last uh, column. Uh, what proportion? Okay, uh, another name for relative frequency is proportion. Calculated in exactly the same way. Let me get this up here. Dine out once or twice. There's once or twice. So part of this will be just, it doesn't look very good there, 0.392. And so what proportion of those dine out once or twice? There's the proportion, 0.392. And if I haven't mentioned this before, uh, I'll mention it now, is that uh, in my math lab, if you typed in um, you know, 0.391 or 0.393, it will give you an error. So it's very picky about rounding. So make sure that you, you round to the desired number of decimal places. And they will tell you, sometimes it'll be three decimal places, sometimes it'll be two decimal places, but just be uh, consistent in how that happens, how you report the answer. And we know that this is 39.2%. A lot of times speaking in terms of percentages is, is more meaningful to us than speaking in terms of proportions or relative frequencies. All right, there are two graphs, uh, C and D. They're very similar. One of them uses the vertical scale frequency, and the other one uses the vertical scale, scale relative frequency. But other than that, the graphs are identical. This is a bar graph. We have one, two, three, four, five categories. The categories will go along the, the horizontal axis, and the frequencies or the relative frequencies will go along the vertical axis. The bars will have gaps between them. And so let's go ahead and construct this um, by hand. All right, so freehand. 
Down at the bottom, we're going to have response. You should always include the axis title so that we know what the, the axis values mean. So we have several per week. That's the first one, several times per week. Um, once or twice. That's the next bar. A few times each month. There's our third category, very rarely. And finally, never. So what you want to try to aim for here is to have all of the bars have the same width and have the same same gaps between the bars. So it looks kind of, you know, professionally done. For part C, it says construct a frequency. So we're focusing in on the column of frequencies here. And the smallest one, we're going to start at zero and we're going to go all the way up to say something a little bit right around 200. So for my scale markings, if I want to go up to 200, I can put 200 up there. Right in the middle would be 100. In between 100 and zero would be 50, 150. And you can decide how many vertical. But what's important here is that this is frequency. So we're going to label that vertical axis as well. And then for each one of the categories, each one of the five categories, we're going to draw a corresponding bar. And the height of the bar depends on the frequency. So this first bar, I'm going to go up to just something a little bit larger than 100. And that first bar sets the, the thickness of the bars for me. So if <clears throat> if that's our gap from here, same gap here, same gap here, same gap here. I want to try to make all the bars the same width and the gaps between them the same width. So once or twice, that's 204. I'm going to go all the way up to something just a little bit bigger than 200. Sometimes we actually just write the numbers right there so it's very clear to the reader. But that's a bell and whistle that you need that you do not need. But you could put it there. A few times a month, 130. I don't think that's about right there. And this is why we draw these with Excel, because uh, our accuracy is not going to be that great if we do them by hand. Very rarely, 79. And maybe somewhere right in here. And then finally, never is five, that's way down here. I'll put that bar outside. And the final thing that you need is a title. And the title can really go anywhere. But remember, this is about dining out. And this is the frequency of dining out. So how often do we eat dinner? So we've got the title, we've got the horizontal axis labeled, all the categories labeled, we've got the vertical axis, appropriate scale with frequencies, and we've got it labeled as frequency. So here is the answer to C. All right, now for D, um, the only difference is that instead of having these counts, these frequencies on the vertical scale, we're going to include a different scale. And the different scale, and in any one graph, you only want one of these scales. You don't want them both. But the vertical scale is going to use these percentages instead of frequencies. All right. Well, it's hard to draw it on there, but so let's say 103 was about 19%, so maybe 20%, 0.20. And if that's 0.20, then that right there is about 0 0.40. And then 0 0.30 would be kind of somewhere in between. And 0 0.10 would be somewhere down here. When you go to my math lab and you do the homework, um, they obviously can't have you draw these graphs by hand. They can't check them that way. So what they typically do is say, select the, um, in part C, select the frequency bar graph. And then they'll give you four, four or five different graphs and you have to select the right one. So it's going to be more, more multiple choice than anything else on these, on these problems. 
But this is a, a bar graph. And this is the second kind of graph that is most commonly used when we're graphing qualitative data. So here were all of our qualitative responses. These were not numerical responses. How often do you eat out dinner? Well, once or twice a week. Never. So on. These were also categorical, different types of plastic surgery. All right, we're now going to merge into uh, some graphs that we commonly use when we're graphing numerical data. What you see here is a histogram. And um, not only will you be asked to select you know, the appropriate graph, but you'll also be asked to interpret the, uh, the, the graphs as well. So here is a histogram. And one of the, the key things that you'll notice, the difference between a histogram, it looks like a bar graph, but it has some key differences. The biggest difference is that the scale is numerical instead of categorical. You'll also notice in a bar graph that we have gaps between the bars to indicate the distinct different categories. But in a histogram, there is no gap. They're all connected. And you have a uniform numerical scale. That's the difference between a bar graph and a histogram. The bar graph graphs qualitative data, categorical data, nominal data. Histograms graph numerical data. So let's take a look at um, this example and let's go ahead and do some interpretation. Uh, part A, what is the most frequent number of cars sold in a week? Okay, so zero or one. And car dealers, um, car salesmen, they get uh, paid based on commission. So the more cars they sell, the better. They make more commission. Yeah, sometimes they have kind of a fixed amount that they make each week, but a lot of them work on commission. All right, so uh, this salesman sold zero cars one, two, three, four weeks. So there were four weeks during the, this period where the salesman didn't sell anything. The salesman sold three cars, that's about one every other day, eight different weeks. There were eight weeks. So the most frequent number of cars sold in a week. There were 12 weeks where they sold four. So I saw a lot, I see a lot of answers of four. And I see, I saw some answers of 12. And that's one of the biggest things to get, um, make the distinction between what the meaning of the x-axis variable and the y-axis variable um, is. For how many weeks were two cars sold? Part B, how would you answer that? For how many weeks, what is the number here, where two cars were sold? Determine the percentage of time two cars were sold. So what would be helpful here is to count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to create the frequency distribution and then a relative frequency distribution of this graph. So I'm going to switch from the graphical representation to the table um, representation. So we have 0 is 4. Uh, one is two, two we already have is nine, three is eight, four is 12, five is eight, frequency is number of weeks. Uh, six would be five, I think I'm getting these right, um, two, one, zero, and one. Now I have to write all these down if I'm gonna answer that question in part C. So I'm going to add up the total number of weeks. You know, maybe it is 52. I don't know. Maybe this is in a, in a whole year. Let's add them up. 6, 15, 23, 35, 48, 49, 50, 51. Yeah, it is, in fact, throughout the entire year, 52 weeks. I suppose that would have been helpful to know that. And for Part C, it says determine the percentage of the time that two cars were sold. Here's two. We have... 9 out of 52, and that's 0.173, and that converts to 17.3%. So that's a histogram, and um, in a second we might construct one. All right, describe the shape of the distribution. What does the shape look like? All right, I want to give you some language so that you can talk about the shape. We're going to look at graphs, and we're going to say, oh, the shape is this. And when you, when you hear 
that the shape is skewed left or skewed right or bell shaped, you have a pretty good sense of what the what the distribution looks like. So describing the shape of a data distribution. Now the data distribution can be uh, in a graph or it can be in a table. But here are the basic ones, bell-shaped. A lot of data sets that we, um, that we look at that involve numerical data will be bell-shaped. And so if you had the horizontal scale here and you had the histograms, what you would find for the histogram is that it would be high in the middle and then it would kind of, as you go from the middle, it tends to um, go down to zero. And so the bell-shaped curve looks something like this, where it's high in the middle and then it drifts off to zero on the right and the left. It kind of, uh, it's called bell shape because it kind of looks like a, a bell. Ding dong. So if you tell me that a data distribution is bell shaped, I, I will know a lot about the data set. I'll know about a lot about the individuals that actually um, were involved in the, the data collection. All right, skewness. Uh, we're going to have skewed right and skewed left. Now on a number line, smaller numbers appear to the left. And so we always describe the distribution based on where the tail is. And so if it's skewed left, sometimes we call that negatively skewed. And the data will look like this. Most of the data will fall to the right, but you'll have a few straggling data values that kind of come over here to the left. So here's the tail. And the tail is to the left. So we say that this is left skewed. Some data sets look like that. Similarly, if you have a data set that's kind of where most of the data is to the left, but just a few data values are skewed off here to the right, then we say that this is right skewed. Sometimes we say it's positively skewed. And I'm drawing these nice curves, but remember they kind of follow the shape of some kind of a, a histogram. You just imagine a, a histogram constructed in the same way that we were constructing them, but you see many of the higher bars off to the right than this is skewed left. Uh, a couple of more um, graphs would be a uniform distribution. In, in that graph, all of the bar heights are about the same. Think about, you know, flipping a, rolling a die and you counted up the number of ones and twos and threes and fours and in all of those numbers, ones and twos will come with the same frequency about the same. And so uniform where all the bars are the same height. And um, the mode is the most popular um, category. So if you have a, a data distribution that looks like this, and the heights don't have to be exactly the same, but we would say that this is bimodal. It has two high points. In this graph here, you can see it, uh, for example, students that take the, uh, the SAT in, in high school, um, you'll see a graph like this because some of them take it when they're, when they're sophomores, kind of a practice run, and others will take it as a junior. And it's amazing how that one year of uh, additional study will lead the scores to be um, much higher. So this would be like the sophomores taking it, and this would be the, the juniors. Now, there are some sophomores that take it that, you know, score over here. But I think if you use those five descriptors to describe a graph, then, then we'll be good. Going back to our problem, what is the shape of this one? You have five choices. Uniform, bimodal, skewed left, skewed right, or bell-shaped. 
no graph is going to be perfect in one, one of those. So we'll use words like uh, it's approximately skewed left or it's approximately uniform. I agree that with the one answer in the chat, this one looks approximately bell-shaped. So if you can draw the bell curve over it, not perfect, but what you look for is high in the middle and close to zero on the ends. So it tapers off. Okay. So we would say bell-shaped. But here is the age at inauguration. This is an interesting problem. So when presidents were uh, first inaugurated, how old were they? We do know that Barack Obama was one of the, uh, the youngest presidents. He's, um, I don't know, in his 40s at least. Uh, we know that. And uh, we also know that the two, the two individuals who are candidates this year for president, uh, one of them will be elected and that means one of them will be the oldest president elected. I think uh, it might even be, um, I think Trump may have been the oldest president when he was inaugurated for the first time. But uh, the data involves um, presidents on their first days in office. So it's not their age in their second term if they happen to have a second term. Uh, with the exception that President uh, Grover Cleveland, his age is listed twice because there was a gap between the first time he was president and the, the, time that, the second time that he was a president. So here you see them. Now, the graph I want to focus on here is the stem and leaf plot. <clears throat> stem and leaf plot. In a stem and leaf plot, we have um, uh, the left digit of the data value, uh, and sometimes it's digits, and all of the leaves here, this is the stem, and all of the leaves here are the right digit, or sometimes digits, of the data value. The advantage of this graph is that we'll be able to see the shape of the data distribution, and we'll also be able to um, look at the graph and see every single data value. This is a useful graph if you have a small data set like, you know, you know I guess President Trump is President 45, number 45, or is it 44? So we should see all 44, 45 data values in here. Now, because all of the data values here are in the 40s, in the 50s, or in the 60s, uh, I want to have more than just three columns here, fours and fives and sixes. So what I'm going to do is, uh, and these, all of these data values in this stem and leaf plot are ordered. So instead of having just three different rows of, of numbers, I'm going to split the stem. And I'm going to split it where we have the lowest data values, 0 to 4, and the highest data values from 5 to 9. So I'm going to have two stems, two fours, two fives, and two sixes. And in the first four, I'm going to put the numbers 40 to 44. And in the second four, I'm going to put the numbers 45 to 49. Similarly with the fives, 50 to 54 and 55 to 59. 60 to 64 and 65 to 69. So here's what it would look like. And we want these to be ordered. Ordered stems, ordered leaves. In some of your stem and leaf plots, you will have just a single stem for each digit. But the left digit, in this case, would be the tens digit. So for our example, the tens digit. And for our example over here for leaves, it's the ones digit, or the units digit. All right, to the right of the vertical bar here, we're going to start entering our data values. So for the data value 42, the first one, it's in the range from 40 to 44. So we're just going to put a numeral 2 there, 42. We're going to continue with these two data values, a 2 and a 3, because those are the only two data values in our data set over here where we have numbers between 40 and, and 44. And we're going in ascending order as we order these leaves 
two and then higher. All right, the next row includes the values 45 to 49. There you see them. So I have to put two 46s, a 47, another 47, and I'm trying to space out these numerals so that they are all the same width. It's like creating a histogram as the bars get higher. Get the idea? All right, then we have some 50 through 54s, a whole bunch of them. There. All right, well, I'm going to run out of room here, but, and this happens uh, sometime, but uh, I'll just start it off 50, 50, and then I have one, two, three, four. What's important to note here is that each data value is recorded in your stem and leaf plot. So even though 51 appears four times, um, we don't just write it once, we write it four different times. And um, all right, after that, we have a 52 and a 52 and then a 54, and I'm just gonna put dot, dot, dot here uh, off to the right to know that we have to include the rest of those values. All right, I'm gonna go uh, fairly quickly on the rest of this, five, 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 and then three sixes, and then a seven, and a seven, and a seven, and a seven, and again, that is gonna stretch off the end of the paper. So, it appears that um, the most popular age of our presidents would be in the, when they're first inaugurated is in the 50s. Most of them are in their 50s when they're elected. All right, these last two won't be so bad. They're not as um, big, but we put all of these values in the next one. So zero, one, 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 two, four, four, and then we have five, eight, and nine. Be sure you include a title, age at first inauguration. And the beauty of this is we have every data value listed there. So if we selected this data there, that data value right there, what that means is that the age is 64. Now the last thing you can do with the stem and leaf plot is rotate it 90 degrees so that you see the entire graph and then if you drew the shape, what would the shape of this distribution be? I'm looking at your answers in the chat. Um, 54, high in the middle, then it comes down like that. So it's high in the middle and it tapers off at the ends down to zero. And so this also is bell-shaped. So that's a stem and leaf plot.